the first liberated woman. I have people stopping me all morning, go, I know who she is, I know. I, I think there's even a little gambling going on on it. I, <laughs> I, I heard something going on, so I don't want to dig too deep into that issue. You know, one of the strongest influences in our society today has been the effect of the uh, women's uh, liberation movement. Now it started as a, a political liberation effort to gain women the right to vote at the turn of the last, not this century, but at the turn of the last century, evolved into a conscious national effort to raise the social and financial and legal positions of women in this nation and around the world. I guess that kind of summarizes, if you wish, this idea. In its best efforts, this movement has won important battles in securing equal and fair treatment for women who have in, in many cases been marginalized or abused because of their gender, and that's, that's wrong. Now in its more fanatical form, many women's rights activists have created a kind of a reverse discrimination by making men the enemy and polarizing the genders instead of bringing people together. And we know that it's, this is not a harangue against the women's movement, it's just history. That's how it's kind of played out in our society. Now the sad result in society today is that women who have made great strides in improving their status and independence have also inherited a lot of the more negative traits of the men that they desired liberation from 50 years ago. For example, there is a rise of bad habits in women that used to be associated primarily with men. More alcohol and more tobacco use among women. More women are suffering from traditionally male illnesses like heart disease, ulcers. That used to be in man's domain. Men are the ones that killed over at 50 from a heart attack. Men are the ones that had the ulcers, you know, I mean, the majority. Competition with men has left, have left many women with the task of having their first child much later in life. Just uh, saw something on TV last night, a report about that. And because of this, they're increasing the risk factor of having children later in life. And of course, decreasing the size of the American family. Women's successes in the workplace and other traditional areas of male dominance has had an effect on the home. The rise in the percentage of divorce and juvenile delinquency has followed the rise in the percentage of women who choose careers outside the home. Now again, don't get me wrong, yeah, Mother's Day, are you kidding me? He's going to attack women on Mother's Day? This is not a criticism of working women. My mom was a working woman. Most women who work outside the home do so because they have to. But the statistics show that when they do, something's got to give. And usually it's the home that gives. So this sermon, as I say, is not about you know, working women. It's not a polemic against liberated women. The thinking in the last few decades has been that if a woman was free to compete if she was free to be independent, if she was free from the dominance of men, she would be liberated, she would experience freedom, and there would be nothing but positive results. Well, our society is beginning to sober up and realize that equal pay does not necessarily equal freedom, does not necessarily equal good things. In the end, the women's movement will realize that they've made the same mistakes that men have made. And hopefully will begin to search for meaning and direction in different areas of life. When that time comes, I would encourage them to look carefully at the first truly liberated woman and how she came to be this way. Everybody's thinking, okay, what's the name? Well, I'm sorry, I can't give you a name. I can't give you a name because her name is unknown. 
Nobody knows her name. But her act, this first liberated woman, her action remains forever. And I'm talking about the woman who washed Jesus' feet and dried them with her hair. She's the one I'm talking about. She's the one I refer to as the first liberated woman. Now there are several stories where women approach Jesus in order to anoint Him. Each of the gospel writers mention uh, an incident where a woman approaches Jesus in this way. In reality, there were two different women who did this and they did it at different times. One incident occurred at Simon the leper's house where Jesus was eating. This was just before the final Passover dinner Jesus was going to have with His apostles. The apostles were there as well as Lazarus and others. Mary and Martha were present serving food. And at some point Mary brought out expensive perfumed oil and anointed Jesus' head and His feet and then dried His feet with her hair. This caused a dispute among the disciples, especially Judas who thought that this was like a big waste of money. Jesus explained that what was being done by Mary to Him was done in order to prepare Him for His burial and that Mary's act would become part of the gospel and thus immortal. And this particular incident is described in various detail by three gospel writers, Matthew in Matthew 26, 6, Mark in Mark 14, 3, and John in John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 to 8. Each of these tell the same story you know, about Mary doing this to Jesus, but they give different information about it. The second incident is described by Luke. And although the action involves a woman anointing Jesus, the location, the characters, the purpose, and the lesson are all different. The account is in Luke, and it's the one that we'll study in order to observe the first woman who found true liberation. So I encourage you to open your Bibles, if you have them, to Luke chapter seven. And I will read the passage where the action takes place. Luke chapter seven, actually just begin in verse 36. It says, now one of the Pharisees was requesting him, meaning Jesus, to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, this man, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A money lender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Well, here's a woman who possessed the type of character admired by a lot in today's society. I mean, she was bold and she was fearless. I mean, she walked in uninvited on a group of men 
Never mind today's woman who has to have meetings with the majority of men at their work and they may be the only woman at the table. This woman was not invited. In that culture she was not even supposed to be there. And What does she do? She barges right in. You know, the lean in, lean back, lean in, that book there by, you know, and, and, it, and the book says to women today, you know, you've got to lean in, be aggressive. Well, this is a pretty aggressive woman. And she was a nonconformist. They knew her as being immoral sexually, meaning that in some way she had broken the rules, she had pushed sexual boundaries of her time in society. Isn't that our society? Aren't we applauding these uh, uh, female uh, uh, artists, singers, and so on and so forth, who 50 years ago would have been in a, you know, a strip club or something, and now it's just all regular stuff, it's pop music, and they're saying, whoa, she is a leader in society, she's empowering women by taking off her clothes? Really? Really? So this woman was that kind of woman. She pushed the boundaries of her time in society. Maybe it was adultery, maybe she was simply sexually active as a single person, maybe she was a lesbian, who knows? And she was successful. I mean, the expensive perfume was not available to the common person, certainly not to the common woman, but she had an entire vial of it. Her boldness, her success, and her lifestyle may have freed her from the conventional limits of her family and the society that she lived in at that time, but she desperately needed to escape. The prison of guilt, the burden of shame, the fear of death, and the loneliness caused by being separated from her God. And so her appearance there that night marked her desire to find true freedom, to be liberated from the sins that were destroying her soul. In the story, Luke describes the seven steps that she took to total liberation. Follow me now. Step number one was acknowledgement in verse 37 and eight. A woman of this nature had no use for Jesus. Think about it. He was no champion for, quote, women's rights. He stood for things that she rejected in the past. So in coming to him, she acknowledged not only her sins, but also her need. And today the message to young people, all of them, but especially to woman, it, women is, Make sure you get into a position where you don't need anybody. You don't need anything. And you certainly don't need men. That's the message. That's the message. The fact that she came uninvited among a group of men who knew her poor reputation was a great risk for her. In doing this, she humbled herself and she acknowledged not only her sinfulness, but more importantly, she acknowledged her great need. She had a need for Jesus. And this is usually the first step to freedom for both men and for women. Step number two, sincerity. Sincerity, she was weeping. Who knows all the reasons for her tears? Was she crying because of what she had done? Was she crying because of what she had missed? Was she crying because of her shame, her anger at others for making her this way, her relief for finding Jesus at last? All we know is that her feelings about Jesus and what she was doing were sincere. This was no preset. No automatic response to a specific command. This was a spontaneous act on the, on the part of a contrite sinner before the one who could and who would accept her and save her. You know, sincerity does not eliminate the need to obey. But obedience without sincerity is not true obedience anyways. We know that, don't we, even with our kids? Brothers and sisters fighting with each other, fussing with each other, they cross the line, they say something nasty or they, they hit or something like that and as parents we say, hey, hey you, you apologize to your sister and you get, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. There's no obedience without sincerity. 
Step number three, repentance. Notice she was paying attention to the feet. I mean, what do you do to make up for being proud? What do you do exactly to make up for being sexually impure? Exactly what do you do to make up for that? Is there anything you can do to take away or make up for these sins? Answer, no. Her resolve to remove what is evil, what is dirty in her life is expressed in her devotion to the Lord. She removes the dirt from his feet with the purifying tears of her repentant heart and she dries them with the most glorious part of her body. Don't go past that, that passage too quickly that she dried, you know, she dried his feet with her hair. And the idea, well, maybe there wasn't a towel. Are you kidding me? She dried his feet with her hair. Her hair, the crown of woman. And she used her crown to wipe his feet. Talk about repentance. Repentance is a change of heart, not only about our sins, but about who Jesus is for us. And by her actions, this woman leaves absolutely no doubt concerning her new direction in life and concerning who she thought Jesus was and concerning how valuable he was, that she was willing to dry his feet with her hair. Step number four, belief. She anoints him. Now you need to understand the anointing of the feet with costly perfume signifies an honor, an elevation of this person. I guess we understand better if we knew what the custom was. The custom required a polite washing of the feet for the guest, usually done by the youngest slave, and perhaps a single drop of oil on the head as a sign of welcome to an honored guest. It was a, you know, a polite ritual. Like somebody comes to your house and you say, can I take your coat, you know, and so on and so forth. If they remove their shoes, can I provide some slippers? You know, a polite thing to do. But to break open an expensive vial of perfume to anoint the feet was an act of high honor, even worship. Her previous acts of washing and wiping showed that she recognized who she was. In kissing and especially anointing the feet, she demonstrated that she also knew and believed who Jesus was. Step number five, forgiveness. In Mark 2 verse 10, Jesus says to the scribes who doubted His power to forgive sins, but in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, you know, and He tells the paralytic to get up and walk, you know, the idea being, hey, if I can do this miracle, I can do this other thing. You know? If I can tell this guy to get up and walk who never walked, then I can, if I tell you your sins are forgiven, they're forgiven, that's the idea. Whether it was by circumcision or sacrifice, later on by the baptism of John or in the end by the baptism of Jesus, forgiveness has always been associated with and possible because of Jesus. While He was on earth in human form, He offered forgiveness directly to people who came to Him personally in faith. I mean the paralytic, the story I just told, or the thief on the cross, and of course this woman who washes his feet, it just tells her your sins are forgiven. He had that power. She came believing not only in who he was, but also believing in what he could do for her. And by their complaints, it was obvious that the other guests neither believed in who Jesus was, nor did they recognize what he could do for them. And so he tells a parable about two people forgiven for big and little debts, to show that their self-righteousness was their main stumbling block in coming to Him. The woman, on the other hand, saw what she was, recognized what her need was, recognized that He had the power to take care of what she needed. She could see very clearly who Jesus was and what He could do for her. Step number six, assurance. 
If they had a song written then, you know, in the first century, I am sure the woman would be singing, you know, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I think that's Fanny J. Crosby, if I'm not mistaken, but if Fanny J. Crosby lived in those days and wrote that song, this woman here would have been walking out the door singing that song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Think about this just for a second, will you? All of you people you know, who feel guilty sometimes, those of you who are Christians, you've been a Christian five years, 20 years, 30, 50 years, and still have these feelings of guilt, and am I going to make it, am I good enough, and all that business, imagine to have the Lord Himself say directly to you in person that you are saved. Imagine that. Imagine the Lord Himself looks at you and He says, hey, I know you, I know what you're about, and I know everything you've ever thought and everything you've ever done. I know it. And you're okay. You're okay. You're going to be with me. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. That woman got that kind of assurance. What a joy. What great confidence and assurance as she continued in her life. Because okay, Jesus thought differently of her. Jesus forgave her, but all those other people who would tell her, you're no good, you're not good enough. Are you kidding me? The stuff you did in the past? And you think you're okay with God? No way. Woof. She could simply think back and say, wait a minute, the Lord Himself told me that I was okay. All that bad stuff back there, he said it was okay, he took care of it. So every time she doubted, every time she fell, these words of Jesus would return to her, reassuring her that her salvation was absolutely sure. And we have the same words, don't we? We can't hear them with our ears, but we can read them with our eyes. And then finally, seventh step to liberation is peace. Peace. Her life, regardless of how successful, how liberated, how independent, had not brought her peace. You know, in 35 years of ministry, I've done a lot of counseling and I've done a lot of counseling, more counseling with rich people and wealthy people than poor ones. I rarely have very poor people that come to me and say, I need a little time to talk with you. And they come in and they talk about their angst or their, their stress, or their depression, or their uncertainty. That's not poor people who come to talk about that. It's middle class people, as Kevin was saying, who's got, who've got three cars in the garage, and a boat, and a four by four, or whatever it is, and you know, they've got all this stuff, and yet, ah, I'm not feeling so good, I'm, I'm stressed. I, whew, I don't even know if I'm going to make it. She found out that nothing in this world, whether it was a change in status or wealth, could produce the peace of mind that she needed. The great advantage that those who try to change things, those who break down barriers, find out is that their new worlds are very much like their old worlds. <laughs> when, that's, when, when you look for peace in those places. This person walked away a free woman, free from her fear, free from shame, free from guilt, free from the chains that would keep her in this world, and finally liberated to become her true self in the image of God by the power of faith and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, that's liberation. And in this world, the message is simply to be liberated into something that will ultimately enslave you. There's so much emphasis and effort made to gain freedom in this world, and yet whenever nations or groups, even genders, reach a new level of freedom, they always realize that freedom in this world is just an illusion. Regardless of the seeming freedom represented by wealth, opportunity, power, position, things that both men and women now equally strive to gain, 
People only feel free when they are at peace with themselves and this peace only comes when we are at peace with God. Amen? Amen. Amen. This unknown woman, isn't it interesting? No name. It would have been so simple to put a name there, but no name. This unknown woman was among the first people in Jesus' ministry to truly grasp this idea and reach out to Jesus in order to find this freedom for herself. She was the first truly liberated woman. Now whether you're a man or a woman, can you say that you're really free? Are you held back by the burden of guilt or sorrow for past sins? And you know what, never mind past sins, how about past inadequacies? I could have tried harder over here. I should have done better over here. No question of morality, just effort. Are you chained by fear of the evil in this world or the fear of illness and the fear of death? Some people, that's all they do, right? The only, the only emotion they, they actually have is fear. They're scared of everything. Is that you? Are you impressed by your inability to be the kind of person you know you should be? Is that what's going round and round in your head? I'm here to tell you that Jesus can free you from all of these things, all of them. He is the great liberator. He is the one who frees us. He is the one who removes our obstacles and He does it with His cross and His power and His word and His spirit. So if you need to be liberated from whatever power is holding you back, then we encourage you to come to Jesus Christ, the great liberator of both men and women. We're asking you to come not to cleanse His feet, but rather to cleanse your soul in the waters of baptism or be restored through the prayers of the saints.